Listen, brother, first of all, thank you for coming and taking oh, your man, time. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you, man. It's extraordinary. Thank you guys, too. Very warm welcome just now. I, I called Kevin and I'll let him know what we're doing here. And it, like, literally didn't take two minutes to say, I'd come. He's in the middle of making a movie right now. Flew down to just spend this time with us for an hour. So thank you, first of all. Oh, no problem. Listen, I want this is a group of people, I think you know, is uh, part of who matched me. So we feed 100 million meals a year mm -hmm. in the U.S. Gonna, we're up to half a billion meals now participate in all these projects. So we do this little thing at my house to make it intimate, make it fun, but we try to bring people that I think are true role models. And mm -hmm. some people are role models of the challenges, mm -hmm. and they still have them, and some people are role models of how to overcome it, and you mm -hmm. clearly are that. You're also, everybody here is an entrepreneur, and you're fucking amazing on it. I mean, you're a producer, you're an actor, you're a writer, you're a fucking comedy superstar. Mm -hmm. model. How do you go from... Model. What's that? Model. A model. Model. <laughs> I forgot that one. Thank you. <laughs> so, but tell me, how do you go from, tell me you're selling shoes at one stage yeah, in your life and yeah. you get your breakthrough. How do you go from that to, you know, one of the highest paid entertainers in the world, man, who makes people laugh all over the earth? Opportunity. You know, um, when you, when you get dealt certain hands, you know, sometimes you have no idea what the turn is going to be. And for me, it was always the thought. It was a thought of doing comedy, but I just never knew how. I never knew what to do or the approach to take, how to get there. And one day the suggestion came up from coworkers of Kevin is an amateur night right around the corner of the comedy club called The Laugh House in Philadelphia. You should go do it. And I was like, I would love to do it. I never knew that these things existed. And when I got the opportunity to do that, I fell in love with the moment that I didn't know how to go get. I fell in love with the spotlight, with the stage that I didn't know existed for me. I didn't know it was available for me at that time. And once I found out how to get it, there was, there was nothing else that mattered except that. It was about that and that only. How was that first time? Tell me about that first experience. First time on stage, I uh, was absolutely awful. I was horrible, people. I was uh, <laughs> Did you horrendous. have a set prepared? Did you go there to Yeah, I had, I had jokes prepared. They just yeah. weren't good jokes. Um, <laughs> but but what, what was good is that I didn't have fear. It didn't matter that the jokes weren't working. It was, I was in love with the fact that I was on the stage. I was in love with the fact that there were people in the crowd that had a microphone in my hand. Every right. joke didn't work, but I would figure it out. The, the silence didn't deter me from wanting to be a comedian. I, I wanted to be a comedian. I just didn't know how For to how do long? it. How long? I mean, tell us a little bit about your background with your dad, your mom, and when did you decide you really wanted to be a comedian? I wanted to be a comedian after I saw Eddie Murphy Delirious. Oh. Uh, you know, my dad wasn't in my house that often, but when he was, he was an Eddie Murphy fan, Richard Pryor fan. And I remember Delirious. I remember sneaking and watching Eddie Murphy and seeing my household laugh at Eddie Murphy. And the quotes would go on for days and weeks about what he said. I yeah. remember Richard Pryor albums and my dad laughing with his friends at Richard Pryor and the things he said and how true they were and how he was a bad man and they loved him. And what I found is that comedy brought my dad and his surroundings together. So for the dark moments that my dad had in his life, which were a lot, the memories that I have that are all positive are associated with comedy. Wow. They're associated with laughter. Wow. So at a young age, I saw the power of laughter. You know, there was such a negative yeah. uh, cloud over my home that when I got to see what laughter did, it made me embody just that. So I wanted to bring that, not just to my household, but to people. So I became the class clown. I became right. the funny guy day in, day out to my mother, you know, to well, my you, brother. Your mom was really serious, right? My mom was very strict. Tell us, tell us about that. And were you able to get her laugh? I made my mom laugh. But my mom, just she's, she's just a no-nonsense person. It would be a couple. Then it would be, boy, get out of my face. Go, <laughs> go sit your little ass down somewhere. Like, it, it wasn't too much. Um, what I love the most, though, is that there was a high level of support from my mother. Yeah. There was always support. There was never um, a, negative, a negative tone of what I couldn't do. It was always whatever you put your mind to is what you can achieve. So yeah. when I got old enough to make the decision and say I wanted to do stand-up comedy, it wasn't met with negativity. It was met with reinforced positivity. That's and beautiful. there was a timeline that was given to make it work. And if I didn't, I had to go and do what she suggested. What was that? It was a year. I had a year. And I had a year to you, figure it out. What were you going to have to do what she suggested? What was I had that? to go to school. Oh, I had to go to school. To study what? 
Uh, it didn't matter. She wanted me in school. school. Yeah, I wasn't the best student, people. I went to community college for two weeks. <laughs> uh, you know, failed several tests at that time. Self-esteem was low. You seem to have done okay in spite uh, of that. Yeah, I mean, I did okay. But don't don't go Google my SAT scores or nothing after this. It's extremely low right now, okay? Your, mom's, your mom was the largest influence on you, it sounds 100%, like. A hundred percent, yes. And, and what did you get from your mom most? Um, drive. Mm. You know, my mother was a woman that was never content. Um... Uh, we were talking downstairs, and I told you, I said, the one thing that I've taken from my mom that's just, it's branded in me, you know, it's, you get one life, and out that one life, you're, you're only going to get out of it what you put into it, and information is free, that's what she always used to say, there's so much free information. She stayed in school. She always wanted more. She wanted more degrees. She just wanted to learn, and yeah. our biggest fights came with me not wanting to learn, you know, naturally as a kid, I wasn't that great of a student. I didn't care for school. I didn't want school. But as I got older and I become, you know, I started to find my way. I became an individual that realized the power yeah. of the thing that was preached to me so much, which was knowledge and information. So the thing that I've taken from my mom is that feeling of never being content never being okay with where you are yeah. because after every level is another level, whether you realize it or not. And I always wanted to see what was past the thing that I got. Yeah. I got here, but what was back there? Yeah. I was never content with being here. So when you look at me now, you know, as a successful comedian actor and you start to, start model, to model, realize the model, tears model. model put the model in there um you know you look at producer you look at writer you look at you know uh network owner you know yeah. uh radio channel that i own uh author there's so many things that are acting as olive branches to a tree because i realize that that tree just grows yeah. it doesn't stop growing a tree only stops if you choose to say i'm not watering anymore but at the age 40, I feel like there's so much more water that I can put in this tree and so many more things that I can have hang from my tree. And that comes just from my mother's uh, ability to reinforce. Mm. And what you think a child isn't receiving, he may not be at the moment, but at a later time, the light bulb will go off yeah. and it's, oh shit, that's what that was about. My lessons that were taught to me at the young age of 14 through 18 have clicked in at the age 24 yeah. to now going on 40. This wow. is when I've realized all the work that she put in and what she was doing. The imprinting had the impact. 100%. Um, uh, she passed, uh, what, in 2006? 2006, yeah. yes. She passed 2006. What was that like for you? Because she was such an influence in your life, and I heard that she didn't talk much about your comedy, if I heard this correctly, mm -hmm. but you found all this material that she'd been collecting. I mean, how did yeah. that touch you? Um, you know, my mom wasn't, she was a very religious woman, so uh, uh, a little uh, fact about my mother is that she never came to any of my comedy shows when I started. Wow. Even if things were going good, she never attended a comedy show, never. And it never bothered me because she supported me, but she, she didn't like the environment. She didn't like alcohol. She didn't like smoking. She didn't like cuss words. So she never went. And I was okay with that because that's not what she yeah. is about. But she would always ask how it went, always wanted to know if it was still the passion um, that I felt that it was for me and if I was going to go through with it. We had conversations about it. When she passed away, we found a box and my mom had clippings and memorabilia from everything that I've done in stand-up. Wow. So though she was never there present, she was aware and gathered all things that her child did so that acted as inklets of any type of success. As minute as they may have been, Kevin Hart's little flyers that were in a newspaper, she clipped it out. She wow. saved it. The things that were in the neighborhood that may have been on a local restaurant or cashier's uh, check cashier place outside, you would see the clippings. All of my hustle and bustle, she tracked. And I think to me that was the most amazing thing. What did, what did it mean to you? That was, that, was my, that was my nod from an angel that acted as you, what you don't know is sometimes better. Yeah. Sometimes it's better what you don't know because finding out is going to do more yeah. than it would have been when I had have known. 
if she had have attended those shows, yeah. and I find that box when she passes, but it mean as much. it's not the same thing. Yeah. But the fact that I found it after the fact, it was the biggest, like, oh, my God. Yeah. Like. Did you feel her love in a oh different way? Oh, my God, 100%. You know, I, and and it made me feel like the support that she gave was even bigger. And now as I achieve the success, I don't feel like, damn, I wish my mom was here to see it. I 100% know that my mom is witnessing it at the highest level and that there's a constant applause and pat on the back. So there's never the feeling or void of yeah. missing or not being present. Because she's here. A yeah. great grace the, be the best. Yeah, really I got tons of stories about my mom that would blow you all away. Tell us another one. Tell us one that touches there's you. A, there's a, the, the real one that's famous, I told um, when I did Oprah, this is, uh, I, I couldn't pay my rent. I, I couldn't pay my fucking rent. It was, I was living by myself. Stand-up comedy just How wasn't cutting it. Uh, I was eight. I was 19. And my half of the rent was $400 a month. Yeah. And I just didn't have it. And I was like, Mom... Look, you said that you were going to help me while I was doing the stand-up. I know I was trying to do it myself. I need your help. They're going to evict me. And she was like, read your Bible. Wow. And I was like, <laughs> I, I read the Bible, but the, the notice is on the door. <laughs> like, they're going to they're gonna evict me, Mom. And she was like, talk to me when you read your Bible. And I'm like, all right, whatever, Mom. A couple days go by. They're changing the color of the notice. The notice is now, <laughs> it shifted to pink. This is serious. Just, right. you got three the, days pink, now. the pink means <laughs> it's real. Mom, they're going to kick me out. I'm serious. I need the money or else I'm not going to have a place to live. Did you read your Bible? Yes. Then if you read your Bible, then you wouldn't be talking to me. Mom, this is not the time. Then you didn't read your Bible. Back and forth, I get off the phone. I'm frustrated. Nighttime comes. I'm in the bed. Open up the drawer, and I was like, let me read this damn Bible. Let me just read the damn Bible, man, so I can really tell this woman that I read the Bible <laughs> and be honest about it so she can help me. I opened up the Bible. The rent checks for the rest of the year I fell out the Bible. Oh, they they're always been in awesome. the Bible. It's a, it's a true what story. A so literally for every month, of that year, and I had missed, I had missed months where I had to scrape and find, it was wow. always there. And her biggest thing was, don't lose your faith, wow. keep faith, read the Bible. So from that day on, that's, magnificent. that's when I started reading the Bible, and then I had to go <laughs> to her. She was like, your ass been lying to me all this time <laughs> about reading that Bible. And I was like, yeah, I've been... I've been lying. She's tell, like, me, tell me one more story about her because uh, she's such a beautiful soul. Right? Another like, one. Another story. you're also giving us some parenting cues here. No, no, no. <laughs> this, it's, it's, this is all real stuff. Yeah, I get it. Um, the, the other one is when she was at her, at her sickest. You know, my mom, she passed away of ovarian cancer. And the thing about my mom, like I said, she was a very religious woman. So she didn't tell us the severity of the ovarian cancer. Me and my brother found out when we were seeing her, things were just changing. Like she wasn't looking good. So we had to basically drag my mom to the hospital. And we found out then that she was trying to take care of herself naturally. She didn't believe in doctors. She didn't want medicine. She didn't want drugs. It's just not what she was about. Yep. By that time, of course, it was, it was too late for the stages that she was at. And the doctor let me and my brother know, you know, at this, this particular time, it's, it's terminal, you know. Yeah. Unfortunately, you're going to lose your mother in, you know, 30 days. It was a short amount of time. Oh, and, you know, it hit me and my brother with, we're shaking up. We're like, God damn. He's like, uh, we should talk to mom about it before the doctor does. Yeah. I feel like it should come from us. And we went to talk to my mom and tell her what the doctor said. And we started talking about the time period. And she was like, you don't have to talk to me about a time period of how much life I have left. She said, because that means that you're wasting my valuable time <laughs> with negativity. She wow. said, when well, we could be doing other things. Wow. She said, I want you to talk to me, spend time with me, wow. read books to me, be with me. At the brink of what would be the worst to so many, 
wow. she was the trooper of all troopers. And we never talked about death. Wow. Until the last stages, we never talked about dying. Wow. Nobody was allowed to come in that room and mention anything about death. It was talking about great moments, family reunions, the time when Stocking. I, the yeah. time when he, lessons yeah. that she did that yeah. she didn't, what we loved the most. Mom, it was nothing but laughter until her dying day. Wow. And that showed me that you can't break a great spirit. Like, that's, there, there's some that's people, awesome, there's some people that have, that's right. you know, such a heavy, heavy weight on them with so much that they deal with, but they're able to maintain the highest levels of positivity, and it's because of their spirit. Yeah. There's a higher thing in just wanting to be happy. Yeah. My mom's want and will to be happy because of all that she's done yeah. is what I saw at the end. She put in all this time, energy, and work yeah. by dealing with my dad and his shit and trying to pick up all the pieces that on those last days, it was about happiness. Wow. Don't stress me out. Wow. It was nothing but happiness. So, I could, like I said, the stories of Nancy Hart are yes. endless, but when you see the way that I maneuver and you look at all the things that I go through in my life and people are like, man, he just keeps going. Yeah. It seems like he's not shaken or bothered or broken. You can't break what's been built yeah. to last. I'm, I'm built to awesome, last. That's awesome, man. That's fucking beautiful. So that's the difference. That's, that's beautiful. Mm -hmm. When, um, tell us a little bit, was your humor always um, self-effacing as a style? Because mm -hmm. you know, we live in a world where people often attack each other. It's an interesting world out there with social media. But you, know, you have this unique style of self-effacing and that you still tell truths. Yeah. Uh, how did that evolve or did it evolve? Was it always your style? Um, it's, you grow into who you're supposed to be in stand-up comedy. You know, in the beginning, you're doing a version of what you think is funny. You don't know what's funny. Right. So you're trying to figure it out. You're coming out and you're, you're throwing everything at the wall to see what sticks. And right. that's the gamble. The gamble with comedy is, I think it's funny. Let me see if you guys think it's funny. Yeah. And if you don't think it's funny, that means I was wrong within my gamble and I got to go back to the drawing board. The high volume of stuff that you think is funny ain't going to be funny. It's not. It's not going to be funny. Wow. But when you start to understand... Even at the stage? With all the no, no, now I'm yeah, fucking... So I'm references. really good right now. This is a different <laughs> stuff. It's, it's different. This is in the beginning. Right now, I'm really good. Everything I say is genius at this stage in my career. Um, now, when you, when you start to get comfortable, you start to realize that I'm funny. I don't have to force yeah, it's and find. Now. It's you. Yeah. It's it's the funny is in me. So yeah. talking about my life and being true to who I am yeah. is what people are going to gravitate towards. People love to relate. People love to see what's real. You love to identify. If I sat up here and I talked about things that you guys couldn't identify with or couldn't walk away and go, wow, I'm alienating myself from my crowd. The best way to open up and make myself a part of my crowd is to be real. Because we all love real. So my life, my mistakes, my ups, my downs, my marriage, my divorce, my kids, that's what we all share. We just share it differently. We all travel. If you don't travel, you want to travel. If you want to travel, where do you want to go? There's so many things that I can break down that acts as connective tissue between me and everybody. I can relate to everybody in this room, and I don't have to change who I am. Because ultimately... You just want to know about the person that you're watching. And when you walk away, you go, damn, that was interesting. That was funny. But if you feel like you know me and you laughed, now you grow with me. So over the years, authenticity and honesty has allowed my fan base to grow with me. Yes. And if you look up, I'm about to be 40. I've been doing stand-up since I was 18. My stand-up special started when I was around 24. When you go and look at me from 24 to now to age 39 going on 40, you're going to go, holy shit. Yeah. I'm watching Kevin Hart become a man. I watched Kevin Hart go through life. Yeah. He put it all out there on stage, and I feel like I not only know him, yeah. but I respect him because he never hid from who he is. Yeah. That's the only way that I can do stand-up comedy. It's beautiful. I can't do it in a way to where I'm talking about what I don't know. That's why I don't do 
politics. That's why I don't talk about things that act as divisive material. It's my job to bring people together. I don't want to fucking divide us. I want to bring us together. So that's that's what I do when that's I'm awesome. on stage. 100%. Tell us if you would, if, 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 if there's a way to look at it, how do you start, let, let's say when you had your first real breakthrough, you told us about your first mm -hmm. kind of flop. When was your first real breakthrough? And tell us, what was one of the first jokes you came up with that freaking worked that you're like, okay, I got this Ooh. shit? <laughs> first <laughs> if you joke. can remember, or a series. First joke that worked. Um, first joke that worked. I, I remember it. I don't, I don't know word for word, but it, it was about people on public transportation. Um, it was it was the the perverted world of public transportation <laughs> and uh, how there's so much that happens from the time that somebody gets on a bus to where they take a seat of and it was like grinding on people, uh, <laughs> accidentally kissing and chest bumping, and the whole thing was basically to say why I'm not comfortable on public transportation Which because of too, yes right? because yeah. of what's been done to me on public transportation <laughs> and and I had a joke about this is a real bad one um, I had a joke about getting robbed by by a little person which was horrible horrible joke back then uh, and it was like a cross-eyed little person and I didn't know they were robbing me because they were looking at somebody else, but they were looking at me. It was, it was bad. None of this material is great material. I'm, I'm admitting that off the bat. I'm just telling you guys my early thoughts. But this, yep. is, this is what makes you realize how easy it is to misconstrue a joke. And within the times that we're in, when you don't know how to tell jokes, you're just throwing shit at the sink. Yep. And in those times, and sensi insensitivity played a high part in what you thought was funny. Right. Now, today, right. you have to be mindful of what you say because the yeah, sensitivity how does, how does, level. How does humor change now? Because, I, you know, you've, everybody's gone through social media elements. You've gone through it's not, about shit you did It's not that ago. it changed. It's that now you're, you're living in a time where everybody's voice can be heard. Social media has given everybody the opportunity to have a thought, write that thought, put that thought out there. And other people can either get on board with that thought or ignore that thought. But no matter what, my thought, my vision can be heard. When you got a plethora of people doing that at the same time, you now have no right, no wrong, no, everything is a, everything is a non, that's, my opinion is this, my opinion is this. It's so much. So for comedy, the best way to adapt to times it's to simply understand that people's feelings should be respected. I get it. I understand it, which is why over the last 10 years, I made the changes that I've made. Yeah. Within the level of respect that you put out, you put out also a good energy of change. Yeah. Some comedians do understand it. Some choose to be edgy. You have to understand the craft of comedy. Yeah. The craft of comedy comes with a shock factor. So when you take away that shock factor yeah, that some people me. hold on to, you take away the one thing that they had in their arsenal that they feel made them funny. It's not that they want to be disrespectful. Yeah. At one point, that's what they were praised as. Yeah. Andrew Dice Clay in his prom was the most disrespectful comedian and would say things and was vulgar, but that's what made him dice. If Andrew Dice Clay performed today, we would all sit and hold our chest and go, can you believe the shit? <laughs> that we're listening to <laughs> because of the times. So we had, he would have to adapt and change to the times. Like we all have to. Yeah. And it's not a bad thing. I welcome the change. I welcome the fact that, hey, within time, there should be change. Yeah. There should be respect. But you also have to also be real. You gotta be real in understanding that the only way to get to the point of change is to understand the mistakes that are made before the change. Yeah. So I'm a person that can raise my hand and go, I made a lot of mistakes. I did a lot of dumb shit, but I've learned from it. I'm better from it all. Yeah. And now I stand and I'm a better guy and I'm a better comedian and I'm a better craftsman. I'm a better entertainer. I'm a better businessman. But it's because of the mistakes that I made. Yeah. If I yeah. don't make those mistakes, I don't get to sit here and be the guy that I am today. You gotta fuck up. You have to fuck up. You have to take risks or you never find what works. I call it fucking up. You got <laughs> to fuck up, man. 
You have to. And it's like, I, I, I want people to understand that it's okay. It's nothing wrong with fucking up. As long as you learn. You have to learn from it. Like, I tell my kids all the time, you're not going to be straight-A students all the way through school. It's not going to happen. I want it to happen. But when it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you're a bad student. It means that on this particular test, they threw some curveballs at you that you just didn't handle correctly. Yeah. How do we accept this, learn from it, and then handle the next test better? Yeah. If I got to the point where I was unrealistic and I go, you didn't get another A? Am I being real? Yeah. Am I being true to what I know and who I am? Am I really giving good lessons? Or am I allowing my kids to understand and grow? Yeah. I want them to understand and grow the same way that I have. And in any and everything that I've done in life, I can tell you guys, honest to God, I have learned and grown. That's the dopest thing about being authentic. I'm real enough to say when I'm wrong, I'm real enough to go, yeah, I get that. I learned some shit from that. Yeah. I'm better because of that. Yeah. But I'm also real enough to say, as people, we all need to take one step back and go, perfection shouldn't be... Uh, it shouldn't be something that's expected from each and every single individual. No human's going to deliver it anyway. You can't, you can't do it. Yep. And at this time, that, that thing is being put on people yep. in all aspects of life. Perfection. Not only perfection now, but perfection for your whole history. Before. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> Which means there's no way for you to grow because you wouldn't have made the mistakes in the first place. The only thing I'm afraid of is them digging up my SAT scores. That's, that's the <laughs> only thing that I'm truly afraid of. Everything else I can handle. I'm just going to get it out there. I got a 585 on my SAT. Let's, I did ABA, CADA all the way down the paper. We had a class trip the same day. This is a true story. <laughs> you, you got 400 for putting your name on a paper. Just I put it out there. So if you guys find it, just know I admitted it first. And I learned from that. If I take the SAT again, sir, I will take it correctly. I did ABA, CADA all the way down the paper. It's a true story. <laughs> <laughs> 45 movies. That's a real number? Yeah, that's a real number. And, and how many years? Jesus. Um, 2004. Wow. 2004, Paper Soldiers, I think. What is this? What year is this? 2019. 2019? Yeah. 2004. That's movie started to get real. years. Four, so it's three movies a year. Is that almost, right? Almost. <laughs> Not all good movies. Not all good movies. A movie called Pass the Potato Salad. Don't go see that one. Uh, there's another one called Something Like a Business. Don't go see that one. Um, but your latest movie was extraordinary. Well, you had so many great victories. But the I, I've, had a, I've had a good run. Um, the Upside was a really good movie. I love the fact that it overcame the obstacles that yeah. it did, that people got a chance to see it, and it showed a different uh, side of me. I think that you know the dramas that I now have on the table that I'm about to shoot uh, show a different side of me as well. Um, you know, at this point in my career, it's about constantly rebuilding and just maneuvering and finding new ways to reinvent myself. Um, drama is the best way for me to show my fan base that I'm elevating and, and yeah. constantly growing. And yeah. within stand-up comedy, it's, it's me making a decision now as to what the next chapter for me will be. And um, it's a tricky one, you know. Yeah. It's, it's, it's how do I come out with a new version of myself, especially within these times today. And that's what I'm going back and forth with now. So it's, uh, it's definitely going to be an elevated version of me. I just don't know what and how yet. And that's the challenge. That's me figuring it out like I do with anything else. You're, one of the reasons I want everybody to meet you is, uh, I, you know how much I respect you. You're mm -hmm. the, <laughs> many people talk about you, one of the hardest working guys in all of entertainment. Thank you. And you're writer, director, producer, all the things we just described, model, of course. But tell me, like, where do you get the drive for that? I, mean, I hear a part from your mom, but mm -hmm. when did you start to think, I'm going to be a mogul, I'm going to do acting? Like, where were the breakthroughs that took you from selling shoes to, and what was your mindset selling shoes still? You're going to build something big even it's then? The, I mean, what, where does this come from? It's the company. You know, when you, when you tell me this room and you say that I have 44 people in this room and these are all people that have taken on an amazing task with me and they act as amazing partners. Um, some people go, oh, man, that's cool. That's good for you and everybody in this room. I'm the guy that goes, well, what do they do? I want to know what you guys do. And then when I find out what you do, I'm going to go and look those things up. 
And I want to know, oh, shit, well, how did they get into that? How did these people get together? How did they meet? More importantly, why, why are they all so keen on doing amazing shit? What, I, I, I don't like not knowing. Mm. I don't like the thought of feeling of being content with not understanding or not wanting. So when I see what other people can do, what can be obtained from a thought, from a want, from a feel, it makes me go, well, I got the same thoughts and the same feelings and the same wants. I don't have what these people have. I haven't done nearly half the thing that these people have done. That makes me want to fucking work harder. That means that I'm not doing as much as I could because these people are proof that the things that I want to do can be done. I'm not looking at one person that got lucky. If I'm looking at 44 people that are doing amazing shit, why aren't I number 45? When I look and I sit in a room and I'm with Oprah and I, and I see Hove and I see Jeff Bezos, I don't sit in awe. I sit and think to myself, Look at where they came from and look at what they are now. More importantly, look at the impact that these people have on the world for real. There's a major impact that comes from individuals. That impact can be an impact of change, positivity, feeding the world. It can be so much more that you never sought out to do. I sought out to be an entertainer and a comedian. I didn't think that I would get to a point where I got 170 million people at the click of a goddamn button. You don't just use it to promote. What I love about what you do is like, you know, we played a little video here where you're talking like, hey, I've been been feeling this way today. I'm feeling down. But then I remember my gifts. and I remember what I'm here to do. And I'm here to light people up. I mean, you deliver messages where people see into your life. Tell us about that. How has that affected your career? The way you use social media? How do you think about that? Because you don't just market. You let people, you know, inside to see what you really feel. You let them behind a curtain. And it goes back to saying, I didn't expect to be able to have that type of access. And when you do, you're now putting a different definition on your purpose. So my purpose is bigger than just making people laugh or selling movie tickets. Yeah. Now it's a feel good that's associated with me. Yeah. Now when I'm in the street and people come up to me and they say, hey, Kev, I had a heart attack, man. I swear to God, I didn't want to get out the bed. But something about what you do and what you say made me get out the bed. I've been trying to get in shape. Hey, Kev, my that's kid, awesome. I lost one of my kids, man. I was so down. But, dude, I see the way that you attack every single day, and you make me feel like there's something else for me in life, that's and beautiful. I'm starting to feel better. When you start to realize that you have a different purpose, that you're reaching people differently, that people give you a different level of energy yeah. because of what you put out, they're giving it back to you, yeah. you now go, oh, shit, I'm making an impact. Yeah. I'm making an impact. Like, yeah. I, there's... There's a bigger thing that I can actually do here. Yeah. There's a bigger reach. Yeah. There's more that I'm adding to my story. And for me to have three kids, if my kids can walk away from it all and go, yo, our dad did so much for so many people, that's bigger than saying our dad was so famous and so funny. That's awesome. That's bro. the that's difference really for awesome. me. That's, that's, really- that's what I'll say. And that's where I'm envious of you and what you're doing. It's because... The success is one thing, but the success has now molded and shaped itself into a, a machine that's for people. You're, yeah. you're helping people. And yeah. there's, a, there's a high level of story that comes with your name that's different from the amazing motivational speaker and the guy that fills a room with inspiration. He's also creating change. Yeah. That's the difference, and that's what I want. So I'm not content with not having that. Where does that I come from that. you? Because I know where it comes from in me. Where does it come from you, that desire to go so much more? Like, you want to make people happy. You want to light them up. But now you're penetrating the way they think about fitness. Mm-hmm. You're penetrating the way they think about being a parent. I mean, mm-hmm. you're really producing that change. When did that trigger happen? Has that always been there? Did you always want that, or did that get triggered by something? I think you fall into it. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, yes. I think, I think that it starts to happen and then it's something that you fall in love with by seeing the progression. You see an opportunity to step into something and you attempt it and then you go, oh shit, yeah. this is actually pretty amazing. Yeah. Hey man, we're gonna raise money and we're gonna give it, we're gonna give uh, a thousand kids a Christmas over the holidays. Yeah. 
Kev, you want to help out? Yeah, guys, I, I don't give a shit. I'm, I'll help out. That's dope. Yeah. Here. Oh, man, I went here and I got to look at these damn kids' faces. This is pretty amazing. Yeah. Hey, next year, what do y'all say we do 2,000 kids? I'll take 1,000 myself. Would y'all yeah. match me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. man, I done gave. Yeah. I done did it again. Hey, you know, <laughs> what about education? You guys in the providing the education? Kev, you, you got a college you want to give to? Nope, I didn't go to college, but I want to make sure the kids don't make the same mistake I make. What if I want to give out scholarships? Yeah. They're just thoughts. Yeah, we'll do it. Would you match what I do? Of yeah. course. I send kids to scholarships. That's your strategy as well, matching, because that's, that's why everything match, I do, match. I want to double it. Everything I do, match. matching. If, you, if, I'm putting up, if I'm putting up, I feel that the people that are coming and stepping up to the plate should at least be able to put up what I put up. Last year, I sent, I sent 60 kids to college for free. Free of education. Um, the year before that, we did 30. So this year, it's trying to do 90. I'm, I'm adding 30 every year. And I've been doing it with um, the United Negro College Fund. And they partner up. They just match what I did. So last year, I put up 600,000. They matched it. The year awesome. before that, we did 300,000. So this year, it'll be me trying to do 1.2 and seeing what we can do. But it's, it's trying to double and grow. Wow. And then it becomes something massive. But I got that from watching Oprah. Oprah sends all yeah. these kids to school. Every year, free of educa yeah. free education. She just gives it out. Wow. And I was like, it's so dope because that's an impact that she's making. How do I follow a trend but make it my own? And it also changes these kids' lives. The future. You have a bigger I'll impact. I'll match you for 600000 this year. How's Jesus that? Christ, yeah, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, that's do that, that, that's, no, that's, yeah, that's yeah, unreal. Yeah, that hey, uh, Terry, write that down. Uh, <laughs> don't let me forget that. Please, if we got that, that's coming out. No, that's unreal. Hell yeah. yeah I'll do it. I'll do it for I, sure. I, I would love that. I'm going to do a medical school for, for some kids, but I, I'd love to do it in the way you're doing it. And I'll, I'll match it right along with what you're doing. I think what you're doing is My biggest man. thing is about the... Within the urban community, what I found is that a lot of things just come from lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, lack of opportunity. And when you know that and you understand that, there's a lot of real uh, anger behind it, but not efforts to change it. So it's not something that you can change overnight. It's something that you have to make the, the, the baby steps to basically help and, and motivate others to jump on a bandwagon that you're creating. So sending kids to college from these communities is one. I was talking to you about uh, what I'm doing with Chase Bank now, which is um, yeah. basically it's called financial fitness. And we're educating the urban communities to understand more about money and how money works because we feel that that's where a lot of the mistakes come from. That's where a lot of the downfall comes from early on in life and simply thinking that debt is okay. And thinking that it's all right to start out behind and not knowing. So me being a person that came from that environment that has fucked money up, not done it correctly, now is at a point where I've done it right. I understand it. I now want to educate and give information authentically that can be received based on where I'm from and what I've done. These are the things now that I'm realizing that my platform has put me in position to do. So the higher level of change that I'm able to really make an impact for is now what I'm doing. So what you're doing now, it makes it more valuable and it shows that my efforts are all paying off. That's and really I, dope, I told man. Him already, we're going to give you unshakables for as, many, as large a group you want that book. Huge. So it'll be one tool. You're going to need more than one tool, but I hope it'll be helpful for Thank you. Thank you, man. I appreciate it Tell so much. Tell me something. How did you become this mogul, dude? Man, how did you go? You have no business background. No business either, background. So how do you go? How have you gone from that to this gigantic platform? Like, you, you've invested in yourself. I heard you put up 10 million bucks on mm -hmm. your, one of the first film tours mm -hmm. that you did. Uh, you put your ass on the line. Most mm -hmm. people don't do it. Most people are looking to do their gig and get a little royalty or something. Why is your mindset different, and how did you become so successful in business? Well, the one thing that I'm most confident in is me. So if I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose on myself. Um, you know, at this point, it was where I knew that I would get a positive outcome and a good return on my investment. Um, I wanted you knew you're to. On you, you I knew, knew that you. I was betting yeah, on me, and yeah, I knew yeah. the potential of my project and what it could do. The biggest reason for my entrepreneurial drive right now is is by being a sponge. When you're around other entrepreneurs and you see what the benefit of a creative mind is, it sparks yours. Yeah. Um, the only way to really get to my goal, if I'm trying to become a billionaire and I want to take that money and throw it back into several communities, I have to surround myself with other people that had that same mentality. And, uh, and 100%, yeah. independent. And the one thing that I figured is that everybody has, it's not just one thing. 
there's several different things. There's several, there's several chances. There's several, um, you know, ideas that you're throwing things at. And out of those ideas, you find a great group of people that you can surround yourself that can help you possibly position yourself in a way for these things to work. Yeah. It's not done as an individual. It's done as an individual that gets a great team around them that can help bring your ideas to a reality. And that's what I've been smart at doing. It's find the right who's, the proximity with the people who have done it. One hundred percent. And, and playing that, with the best. And that are great at being team players. Like I have no ego. I don't know at all. I, I don't have the education that matches up with the things that I've done or that I'm doing. But what I do have is the understanding of how things work. And when you get the people that have a different type of understanding and you match my understanding with yours, you have something that is destined to succeed. Because you're putting a creative vision and a, 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 real, a real hindsight with the education and the the structure yeah. and the systematic view and combining those things, you now look up and you have companies. That's yeah. how companies get built. Yeah. And and when you have a team, a real valuable team that has a, a, a high level of energy and effort and want and will to make something work because they believe in it, yeah. the chances of you losing are very slim. I've been lucky enough to work with great people, and I credit my team um, every chance that I get because I don't get here by myself. I get here with people that help motivate and push and stay true to the course that we all are on. So from Heartbeat Productions to Laugh Out Loud to uh, uh, Sirius XM to right now my book publishing company to uh, I can say me right now with my one my newest one is to start my own audio book lane like i'm noticing that within audio books they're they do amazing but they go to yeah. one particular place yeah. you have audio and yeah. you don't really have yeah there isn't really anything else out there yeah. so what is something else that can act as a competitor that can engage and do the same thing and if there is something who acts as your catalyst to make people aware yeah. that is there yeah so i'm a person that can do that i'm a person that can springboard ideas based on uh my my knowledge and also my fan base, you know, yeah, yeah. my my social media, um, my social media whole platform that I've built allows me to do things differently. I can also say that right now within fitness, I'm launching. Say, like, how does you keep your energy so high? I mean, your energy is part of your signature, right? One hundred percent for everything. So where does that come from, and how do you maintain it in sports so everybody knows you? You well, work your ass I, off. I man. can't. I can't do what I do and not be in shape. Yeah. We we travel a lot. We're up all night. We're doing yeah. shows for hours at a time. You want to give the greatest performances that you possibly can. If you can't breathe, you can't do it. Yeah. If you're huffing and puffing, if you're weak or you're in the hospital or you're sick, yeah. you can't do it. Your, yeah. your shows don't last. So, so you're up at like, what, 5.30 in the morning every morning? Working I'm up 5.30 in the morning. Every, every day. Morning, every day. That's Not awesome. Stop. That's and awesome. because of the dedication I put in physical fitness, I'm now launching my physical fitness, health, and wellness line. So we just launched a multivitamin uh, called Vita Hustle. After that, we'll be doing amino acids. Um, we'll then be doing organic protein. Literally, you're going to see me lay out strategically something that people believe because they've seen how much dedication I put into it. I don't just throw things at the wall because everything that I do should coincide with my life and my lifestyle. So from XD, those are weights. I'm big in the gym. Everybody yeah. knows that. So now I'm investing into weights and into how yeah. weights are built and last. Yeah. So you're going to see a lot of me in that in that realm uh, of business. You're going to see much more of me over there. And it's because just that's where another passion is. And I think that's where I can get an extreme following in return. Uh, you and I talked about we both have thought of our lives in long, long term, 10 year chunks. You were talking about your 10th special. Tell people how you think about life that way mm -hmm. in terms of you don't look at this right here. You're looking at the long term. My special right now um, comes out in two days on Netflix. <laughs> gotcha. Shameless plug. Um, this is number six. The goal is to get to 10. The reason why I want to get to 10 specials is because that gives you 10 chapters of my life. Like I talked about earlier, I'm allowing you guys to watch me grow and progress into the man that I ultimately want to be. So when I get to special number 10, you're going to see me at age whatever. You're going to see my kids at age whatever, possibly grown with kids, without kids. You're going to see me now retire and do whatever. Um, there's going to be an amazing punctuation 
on me and comedy. And you'll get to say that you witnessed from the bad to the good because I put it all out there. And at the end of it, there's going to be a tenfold series that basically says Kevin's life in a nutshell. And all my stand-up specials go together. So if you look at the names, it's basically a big game that I'm playing that nobody else is aware of. You got Grown Little Men. That's because when I first started, I felt that I was grown, but I was little, so nobody believed me. After Grown Little Man, Seriously Funny came. The reason why I named it Seriously Funny, because I was serious about being funny. This is my <laughs> career. There's nothing else, guys. I'm very serious. I'm funny. So trust me. I'm not doing anything else. After Seriously Funny, Laugh at My Pain. Laugh at My Pain is when I first saw that within all the happiness that you can have hurt. That's when I lost my mother. That's when my dad and his drug addiction got to another high level, and I had to deal with all this stuff while still trying to maintain a drive and stand-up comedy. After Laugh at My Pain... That's when Kevin took that hurt and didn't know how to deal with it, so I started doing stupid shit. That's when the next special came out called Let Me Explain. I had to explain <laughs> all the stupid shit that I did because I saw you and you saw me go through what was pain. And then over the next year and a half, I did things that I had to explain. Now that I've explained, everybody was saying, what now? We've heard him say why he did the things that he did, but what is he going to do with his life now? So I named the next special. What now? After what now? I'm back. Highest of high. I've regained my composure. I've let all that emotional baggage go. Career is out the window. Movies are great. Up. I fucked up again. Irresponsible. What did I do? <laughs> Irresponsible things. So right now, you get to see irresponsible. Right now, it's been a year and a half, year and eight months, going on two years since my last act of irresponsibility. So now going into the next special, it's about going from irresponsible back to responsible. But what are the things that are going to justify me and my responsible behavior and what separates this from let me explain? So this is the growth and the drastic change that you're witnessing, but the titles really coincide with my life at the moment. So by the time I get to special 10, I don't know what the title is going to be, but it's going to be a closing chapter on me and stand-up comedy because I'll be done giving because I will feel well, that I gave all. Going, you'll have that shit done by the time you're 50. Well, well, yeah, well, the next 50 well, years. <laughs> hopefully it's before then. I want to I wanna sit down when I'm 50. I need to sit my ass down, hopefully. <laughs> okay, hopefully, good. fingers crossed. That's great. Tell me, um, who was your role models growing, growing up, and who, who do you really respect in comedy today? Who, do you, who appeals to you? Um, today, I mean, there's a list. Dave Chappelle. Um, He's incredible. Dave Chappelle's unbelievable. Jerry Seinfeld, an amazing friend, mentor. Um, Chris Rock. Yes. Unbelievable. Um, who else can I say today that I really watch? Uh, Bill Burr. Bill Burr is very funny. Oh, yeah. Um, I would say mainly Chris and Dave and Jerry. I like the fact that Jerry Seinfeld... You guys don't even know when a Seinfeld show is. Like, you have no idea what Seinfeld is doing. Yeah. But he's never stopped. Yeah. He's never stopped doing comedy. Jerry Seinfeld has consistently put out new hours, and he just doesn't release them. He just does it for him and his happiness. He does corporate shows all over. Yeah. And he'll do it for a year and stop and go back to comedy clubs and rebuild another set and go out with new material and tour for another year. And I love the fact that he does it for him. He doesn't do it for anybody really else. Cool. He doesn't do it for credibility or awareness. The man is a billionaire. I mean, yeah. he's got money out of his ass. He <laughs> performs for rooms just like this. Yeah. 40 people, and he's very happy with telling his jokes, and he goes about his business. I love that. I love that throughout the years of all that he has done with the levels of success that he's reached, that he still finds fun in telling jokes. So I'm forever a fan for that. Chappelle. I like Dave. And love Dave as a friend more than anything because Dave is true to him. Mm. It does not matter what you think, what you feel. It doesn't matter what you say. You will not shake Dave Chappelle's approach to life. He is forever him and forever will be. The information that I get from him is always taken in and I listen to it. Granted, I can never do the shit that Dave does. But... I like the fact that there's a great definition behind it when he tells me why. Mm. It's never just done just to do it. Chris, one of the smartest men that I know. Mm. I, I mean, he's brilliant. On stage, off stage, in the business, out of the business. 
He's brilliant. And what I love the most about him is he gives me energy by saying, Kevin, I should have done things the way that you're doing them from a business perspective. Mm. And now I'm motivated by seeing you take comedy and mold it into all these other things that I feel that I missed out on. But now I'm now going back and I'm starting at this point in my career. So, Kev, you've given me a reason to start doing something else that I'm excited about while still doing comedy. And I'm like, well, Chris, I'm a better writer because of our conversations and because of what you do. I write my jokes. I construct them differently. And there's a yin and a yang that we have. Yeah. And it's been that way for you know, 14 years, Wow. 14 years. And I think the best thing about having those relationships is that they're real. I don't have anybody kissing my ass in the business. I have people that tell me what it is and how it is. If I suck, you suck. <laughs> if you're wrong, you're wrong. If they feel like you're doing a movie and you're just trying to get a check, my friends talk to me about it. And I don't have many. I don't have many that have that relationship. And from a comedy perspective, those are the three that I really value and hold on to. And then what, what is your brand? Who are you as you look through it? I mean, everybody has their view of who you are, but what's... what's right now, I would say the, the best definition uh, that I would put with me is flawed. Mm. You know, I'm flawed. I'm openly flawed. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that you can't do or you can't have. It means that you're, you're a person. And as a flawed person, I've somehow managed to still be an amazing father. Uh, I'm still an amazing husband. Um, I'm still a provider. And I'm a visionary. Yes. And I think with being a visionary, you realize that you become a leader. Yes. And within me and my leadership and what I put out there for those that work for me or that are part of my empire, it's not a boss and employee relationship. It's a, it's a we relationship. And the best way to lead is to make people feel a part. Yeah. My team feels like they're a part of everything that I have because they understand that I can't do it without them. And I learned that in life, if you can walk away by being a leader and turn around and see the people that you've led and look at what they now have in life, that's the best that's the best justification of how you led because everybody was able to obtain their own. So right now, I have people that have obtained their own. So I would break it down to a flawed family man that loves to lead and see his people win. That's how that's I would define Kevin Hart. That's fucking awesome. Let's that's have a hand for that. <laughs>